is the Lydian Spin with Lydia Lunch, Tim Dahl with our special guest, David J, bassist, composer, writer of books and plays, musician, collaborator, am I leaving any? Oh, was in the original, one of the original members of Bauhaus and Love and Rockets. Did I leave anything out, Mr. David J? Oh, it's pretty comprehensive. Thank you. <laughs> we'll go, we'll go deeper. <laughs> So uh, what's the latest, my friend? Uh, what are you composing now? You just released a record recently, didn't you, in the past few years? Uh, yeah, well, my latest project is called Night Crickets, and it's a collaboration with Victor De Lorenzo from the Violent Films and uh, my friend Darwin Miners. And this was a project that we, we initiated during lockdown, like in the thick of that, and it's a totally remote recorded album. Um, we, originally, we just did it as a, a little experiment to see you know, if it was gonna work at all, with the idea of recording a couple of tracks, and it did work. And we knew straight away that we had something, something pretty special going, so we just carried on. What's the, um, dire what's the direction of that? What's, you know, wh wh where are you in sound-wise now? What's the vibe of the recording? Uh, it's a bit of a, a melange of oh, different styles. I, I hear, I mean, Victor's a, a great drummer and he has a, a jazz, a jazz uh, thing going there, but also kind of like a, a motoric, you know, kraut rock. Okay. Um, Those are kind of opposites in some ways. And um, Darwin is, uh, he's a multi-instrumentalist, um, very great sort of melodic sense. And then he's a, mix, a really good mixer. He mixed the whole thing. And I, of course, play bass, uh, but also some other devices, such as the, my, a thing I really love from Bombay, which is a, it's called a Rajini. And it's a little box of electronic delights. And it's sort of, it's basically a drone box. And, but you can oh. tune it to different frequencies and um, that's running all the way through this album. It's a bit of a, a glue element. Um, so I would throw that into the mix as well as play some keyboards and some guitar. We just, we just trade files just back and forth until we all felt like, okay, this is what, this is done. So on to the next one. And it went really quick, very quick process. And we carried on recording after making the album and we've now got enough for a, at least a track EP. Did you, so just, did, did you carry on remote recording or then did you do some live recording? I love them. I've done a lot of things remote recording. I'm, I think it could be, you know, it works out just fine if you're with the right people. Exactly. Yeah. And we're, well, I'm certainly with the right people. And yeah, we just carried on that way. We haven't actually been in the studio physically together yet. So the question is were you with some of these bigger acts you're, you're involved with in the past? I mean, yeah. even before COVID, a lot of uh, pop, more pop stuff was still kind of remote. A lot of times you hear about stories about the bands just never being in the room at the same time. And or there's cool. a producer there and they go in there and punch in their tracks and all this stuff. I mean, did you have a history with working remotely, even pre-era of uh, internet slash pandemics? I did a track with uh, the producer, Dove Gabriel, and uh, a hero of mine, you Roy, uh, where I just played bass and I, I wasn't in the studio with either, either of those guys and just sent me the file. And I was, I was working with an engineer, co-producer, uh, Robert Cakley, who's very good in that area. Um, so occasionally I would dip into that, the, the remote sphere, but I, I do, I mean, I love being in the studio and interacting with the musicians and- yeah. And I like that. You can't sort of beat that kind of immediate feedback. And well, particularly uh, as a rhythm section player, just finding that sweet spot between the, the drums and the bass. And that, that, I mean, if you have a good connection, maybe that happens naturally, but sometimes the arrangement in itself requires some tweaking to make that really lock in and groove, at least my experience uh, with it. As, as, as bass brothers here, were you originally a guitar player who went to bass or was bass? kind of first and you because you're a multi-instrumentalist basically but by how you describe your process but but you're known as a bass player like where did where did the bass begin 
initially I, I played six string guitar. Yeah. I'm trying to work out songs on the Ziggy Stardust album. Um, <laughs> along with, you know, like six other kids, all of whom wanted to be the lead guitarist. And we right. had a, it was kind of a band, but it wasn't really serious, but nobody wants to play bass. And I just volunteered for that because one thing that I was really into at that time, this is really early on, was um, reggae. And I, you know, I, I understood that the bass was a big part of that. And a big, so that's a big part of the roots of my playing as a bass player is reggae. And then when dub came along, um, not long after that, I really dived into that area. It's funny you say that because I was revisiting some Bauhaus stuff that you're on today and I, I i kind of i hadn't checked it out in a while i'm like wait there's so much dub in this <laughs> it's like yeah. even though you one wouldn't think of that but just all the oh, yeah. all, all the echoes and delays and all that stuff it's just like it's it's yeah, yeah. just the way that, uh, like i mean bella lagos is dead is a kind of a dub track there you go you know? yeah, exactly. oh, okay D david you, you you brought it up so i just have to say i mean that is such a classic song that I mean, that defies almost genre. And of course you're writing it and you wrote the lyrics, which is great. And it's just so classic. And the thing is, I was trying to get it out of my own head before this talk, because it's in there. It's, it's an infectious, infecting song. But when you're writing it, how could you even know that it would be still all these years later, something that's still being used in, in, in was it used in American Horror uh, Story Hotel or not? I think it was, yeah. I mean, it's been used so, so many times. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you just don't know when you're writing that or did you? Did you think, oh, yeah, this is like, this is the shit. We did. I mean, we didn't know that it would have such longevity, but when we when we came up with that, the music, because I'd written the lyrics the night before we rehearsal practice or whatever. <laughs> We got together and we just, the way we worked was that we would just all, we wouldn't have a premeditated idea of where we were going to go musically. We'd just all start playing. Yeah. It was sort of like survival of the fittest for the most interesting element would, would emerge and we'd go with that. So it just, there was like this, like this witch's cauldron, just yeah. mixing it all up and seeing the, the vapors rise. And, uh, <laughs> the vapors are still rising <laughs> and still infecting and still right. infecting <laughs> but we knew we knew it we had a feeling like oh my god what did we what what did we just do yeah you know well, you, you wrote the lyrics but it sounds like you're, you're doing all this film score you're doing all this stuff you're very musically involved in the projects you 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 are that you're involved with so you just wrote the lyrics? Did you not write the music at all with a Bella Lugosi's Dead? Arrangements, maybe? First, and I just handed them to Peter, and um, and then the rest of us started playing, and I mean, I came up with the bass line. It's actually oh, bass, they're cool, really chords, um, not just single notes. Um, and Daniel was, you know, being Daniel, very original. And Kevin played a bossa nova beat because he just started taking lessons from a jazz guy and that was one <laughs> of the two rhythms that he knew. And then, and then we started putting dub effects on the bossa nova. Yeah. Let, know, let's, go, yeah. let's go back. That's before, cool. That's really let, cool. Let's go back before this, because you were saying how, you know, you were influenced, of course, by Ziggy Stardust. How old were you when you first got a guitar? And what was the music that was inspiring you then? I mean, did you just say, hey, I need a guitar, mom? <laughs> Um, I was 14 and it was it was that music. The first Bowie Bowie track I heard was on the old Grey Whistle Test, that TV show. What track? And, uh, it was uh, Andy Warhol and it was before it was before Ziggy had come out. And they used to show old movies like black and white silent movies, if you recall. Maybe you don't know the show, but they would play Yeah. Okay. They play that music, play a track, and they'd have this old movie. So I didn't see Bowie. I just heard this this music, and it really, really knocked me out. And the next day, I went down to Spinner Disc Records in Abington Square, Northampton, and purchased a copy of Hunky Dory. Mm. And uh, I was being up on the top of a double decker bus, just pouring over the lyrics. <laughs> it's totally transported to, to this world. Now I'd only heard the one track, so I I ran 
from the bus stop <laughs> to my house to put this on my parents' record player, which was this big mahogany, you know, like it looked like a car. Yeah, those old wooden turntables. They were like, they weren't turntables, they were giant components yes. to play records on. Yeah, yeah big piece of furniture. But yeah. very good speakers, big 70s speakers, you know. And I played the album one side and the other side, and oh my God. That was it. I impression on me. You know, oh, I wonder, I wonder, wait, 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 excuse me. The first album I got, and I don't even know how it came into my hands, was Space Oddity. And, and what's interesting is I know you've recorded some stuff with Chris Connolly, who I adore. And once we did live, one of my favorite songs from that album, which is Unwashed and Somewhat Slightly Dazed. I see a phallus in pigtails holding hands with the queen. I can remember those lyrics better than my own. I was a huge Bowie freak until Diamond Dogs. Yeah. Absolutely. I, I'm, wonder, I'm wondering if this giant mahogany. Uh, uh, <laughs> Magnavox. Or yeah, yeah I, I, that your parents had it with the big speakers. I wonder if that had influence on you, at least subconsciously, with picking up the bass. Because the low end, if we're thinking about the same really, thing. I, I heard reggae. I would sneak in with my mate into a, a skinhead disco. We weren't supposed to be there. <laughs> what, what year um, are we talking? What year are we talking? 1970, 71, when we were 13 and 14. And it was just being in that environment. And they had a big sound system. And then hearing that, and they had these, these records that were direct from Jamaica. You can only hear in that, that environment. Also, they play hits as well. Um, but hearing that sound in the dark, in the company of a pretty hardcore skinhead, it was very <laughs> stimulating, you could say. So they would ply us with beer and get us drunk, you know, which didn't take much because we were 14. But yeah. I think the benefit that we share is almost the same age is that period of music from 71 to 73 or 4, which was like. Bowie, the Mick Ronson stuff, glam. And even though that was never reflected really in my own music, it was so, and Alice Cooper, that period of music, which there were shows on British TV, there was the press about it, and in America too, the Friday and Saturday night, was so influential because it was so unpredictable and diverse and allowed, I think, an inspiration for us to also become diverse in our musical and our musicality. Yeah, and there's also an explosion of Technicolor in a very drab landscape, you know, just, yeah, it was very, very exciting. What actually preceded Bowie was T-Rex, Mark Bowler. Yeah, of course. The only fan club I've been a member of, the T-Rex fan club. Did you ever see yeah. T-Rex live? I didn't, know. I didn't either. Oh, sad but true, sad but true. I didn't, I didn't really have the, I couldn't sort of, in those days, grasped the concept that you could go out and see these magical beings in a hall. You know? Is that because <laughs> where you I lived? I mean, in a way, maybe I wouldn't have wanted to anyway, because they were sort of otherworldly to me. Interesting. Well, and, I, and I, then... I, I saw a lot of people in 73 that were otherworldly, and I'm very happy that I did. But the beauty okay. was when you would see a group, for instance, like Roxy Music, if we're talking mm. 73, it would be in a not a club, but not an arena, in a theater that you could actually appreciate because of the intimacy of it. And that was pretty monumental, I would say. Sure. Did you have, uh, I mean, eventually you, you crossed that line and started going to shows oh, yeah. of people you liked. And, and was there any really one or two shows that were really essential to your formative years that you that just kind of like, oh, that's what a live act should do. That's how, that's how it should be presented. Well, I'll tell you, um, that didn't really happen until punk when I went to see the Sex Pistols and the Clash in 76 at the 100 Club. Yeah. And that was a galvanizing, you know, like seminal moment. Uh, yeah. Uh, um, but I tell you, the, the first gig I tried to go to, that was nearly my first concert, was the, the, the iconic one that um, Bowie played Hammersmith, you know, the film, the, the retirement of Ziggy, that gig, I nearly oh. went to that gig. Because in those days, because there's no inter internet, of course, you'd have to apply for tickets if you were out of London, in which we were in Northampton. So you'd send off what was called a postal order, the amount for the ticket. And it was just like, 
you know, chance whether you get one or not. And my friend and I, David Exton, we're both big Bowie nuts at school. We sent off for two tickets and we got one back. Oh, heartbreaking. So we ceremoniously ripped it up. Because neither oh. of us could the idea. Did, did Bowie not end the Ziggy Stardust tour with an absolutely devastating version of My Death Waits There by Jacques Brel? Oh, yeah. Oh, bruising, bruising. Yes. Fantastic. Yeah, that's a good, good word for it. And uh, oh. he, that's how I discovered Jack Bell through Bowie and, uh, and a, a few other artists like uh, Iggy Pop and the Stooges via Bowie, uh, even the Velvet Underground, Lou Reed via Bowie and Scott Walker via all via oh, Bowie because yeah. he would have interviews and he would, you know, he would um, champion these artists that inspired him. Do, do you think, uh, so going back to you saying that the, that, that infamous uh, date with the Sex Pistols and the Clash at the 100 Club, mm -hmm. but having been previously influenced more by glam, because let's face it, when they say punk rock, they include so many bands, like magazine, I don't consider punk rock. It's far different. It's more elegant. It's just that time period. So you're influenced by first Bowie, then you see punk rock, then you start a band, but Bauhaus, unlike quote unquote punk rock, had an elegance, had a sophistication somehow mysteriously even from right out the, the gate that is related to a glam essence. Oh yeah. Because as far as the theatricality, the elegance of the music, uh, you know, and, and the violence being of, very different, right. All four of us were very much into that, you know. And so, yeah, it was, I mean, we were, yeah, post-punk and that's when I mean music got much more interesting because it had to evolve and it was very quickly after punk I mean it was really 78. Yeah. Who were some of your favorite bands at that period? I mean I love Magazine, Wire, those were, those were two of my favorite bands of that period. The pop group. Absolutely yep. yeah. Um, the Fall. The Love the Fall yeah um the birthday party who oh, my favorite at the it? time what Sorry? birthday part the birthday party my one of my all-time favorite bands but just the birthday party not afterwards just that amazing yeah we went on so we we were, went on tour with them um, <laughs> it was their first time playing in england when they come over from australia and they were on they were third on the bill they were opening um and it was uh, Subway Sex run after them and then us. But my brother and I would go out and watch them nearly every night at the birthday party. And we uh, thought, you know, they should be headlining, really. They well, were incredible. I mean, February. Roland S. Howard just, you know, we still do a Roland S. Howard song. As you, can, as you saw the other night at our show, we still do a song by Roland S. Howard, Still Burning. One of the yeah. Songs yeah. Fantastic. So, how did how did the Bauhaus fans uh, how, how do they take the birthday party? I mean, sometimes <laughs> double, sometimes sometimes fans of like a headliner band that are so dogmatic with the, the bands they're into, they, they they kind of don't like the other bands or something. I don't know what that is. It's but very much just, that. It was okay. I wonder. Yeah, because yeah, it was, it was, it was, uh, they were not um, they were not receptive, and Nick <laughs> Nick was not. very. Nick was very impressive the way he dealt with that. And he, he was confrontational back then, very much so. And he would go into the crowd and he'd, he'd somehow locate the, the most um, dangerous elements in the crowd. Mm. And it'd be some big guy, you know, and he'd go <laughs> up and just sing to them and maybe put a hand on this guy's chest and basically fuck with him, but in a very interesting way. Yeah, and uh, and I, th I I thought I was thinking about this the other day. Uh, I think it wasn't just aggressive confrontation because there there was a seed there that was to do with compassion and then like a great depth that Nick has certainly, you know, he's evolved into this. <laughs> well, so evolved <laughs> into this, like, into this, yeah, <laughs> almost so like saintly, you know. Well, um, let's call it a fucking Christian. Why not? <laughs> but there's, yeah, I don't know. There was something there when he was when he was in this like maelstrom of uh, impending violence. 
Yeah, it was beautiful. They, they were very, very edgy. It was and, a be and, beautiful, uh, beautiful thing. Was there any uh, tours or double bills back in that period, like, you know, mid, mid to late 70s, that other bands that you were on, you were just like, this is, forget it. This is, this is so not working. Or what were your favorite groups to tour with at that time as well? Uh, well, I would, I mean, most of the gigs I saw, I really liked because I'd be very selective. Um, but the ones that opened, to... the ones that were playing with Bauhaus. Oh, with Bauhaus. Well, we didn't start touring really to like, uh, 1980, 79, 79 was the first one. Um, bands that were opening for Bows or that we were opening yeah. or, or just gr groups that you're playing with. Yeah. yeah. Did you okay. have any choice? Did you have a choice in suggesting who would go on tour with did, you at the time? We did later on. Yeah, of course. Uh, a bit later on, not initially. Um, we were working with uh, two great promoters called Finer Solution, and we had absolute trust in them, whatever bills they were put together, they were very hip. Uh, one I remember in Northampton, the town hall was with Throbbing Gristle. We opened for them. <clears throat> and my mum and dad came down to see that oh, again. Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> on their way to the Conservative Club. <laughs> and my dad was in his suit and his big kipper tie. And my mum was in her fur coat and pearl. And they called in, you know, they stopped. They say, well, we'll stop by and see the boys before we go to the Connie Club. So um, they, I think they stayed for... Two, two of our songs. And I saw my dad the next day and he said, yeah, David, that lot that follow you around, they're like the bloody living dead. <laughs> <laughs> well, dad understood what he was saying, I guess. He was, he was right. But anyway, we, we Daniel and I stayed for Throbbing Gristle and we were down in the front and we, we really liked that. Um, we were kind of perplexed because we were feeling so up and we were hearing this wall of sound, you know, like the Throbbing Gristle in 1979, this was, and uh, an atonality. But we felt like, hmm, we're like, very happy here. And we went on anything, drug-wise. But then we saw Jen afterwards, and we mentioned this. He said, oh, that might be something to do with the negative ion generators. And so what are you talking about? <laughs> and he's got this industrial size negative iron generator at the front of the stage, um, charging the air, you know, like after a thunderstorm. And it did make you feel very sort of elevated. And we each each of us went out the next day and bought a little mini one. And, and and did, did the mini ones work? Yeah, great. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, another, but another gig, again, a final solution gig was with um, Tuxedo Moon. And Chrome, I think, or the other band in you London. Know, that was. one of my favorite albums of all times, and I it's so beautiful I can't listen to it, is by Stephen Brown and Blaine Reininger, and it's called Two Hundred Years of Music Live in Portugal. I can't even listen to this album. It's so devastatingly, heartbreakingly beautiful, and it's just violin and piano. I really what recommend it. It's, it's so gorgeous. It's I can't listen to it. I've just done a track with uh, Stephen. Oh. They're lovely just, people, yeah. They're really just nice. Being released, yeah. Um, and it, it's a, uh, it's one of these lathe cut singles. Only a hundred copies made. And uh, it's uh, the, the subject is William Burroughs on the run after he shot his wife. Uh, yeah. Is it piano and bass it's, and other it's instruments? It's instrumentation. In what? Pardon me. Exit and ombre. Invisible. Is oh, the title. What's the, the instrument? Title. What's the instrumentation? Uh, well, Stephen sent me this sort of arpeggio keyboard thing, and I, with my friend Tim, Tim Newman, um, time stretched it like in a very extreme way to the to a degree that Stephen didn't even recognize that that was his part. Wonderful. So, cool. So it right down. And then built on that layers of like drones and electronic, all electronic sounds. Um, and then I just recited. It's basically a poem. Um, and is that is that out or is that something you've just been working on? It just came out. Was William S. Rose on the run or, I, or was he just kind of rich? He's kind of just 
walk off uh, un, untouched <laughs> I, I, when, when he killed his wife. I, he was kind of on the run because you know he didn't know what the what was gonna what was going to happen. He got he got away uh, with it. He did. What writers? I mean, I dedicate, I dedicate the single to his wife. Thank you. Um, what writers? You mentioned Burroughs. What other writers were influential to you as somebody who's written books, written plays, and I want to get into that soon. But what writers were influential to you? And when did you really, you know, we know that we you go into music. When did you really get into literature? And what was it? Um, well, I had a great teacher at school, Mr. Elderkin, English teacher. And he was a bit of a maverick. He was a maverick guy. And he would go off the syllabus, actually, and bring in things that he thinks thought that we should be learning about. Uh, the first time I, I was exposed to Allen Ginsberg was via him. Um, and he would do he would do things like, um, I remember one, one lesson we all went in, this is when I was about 14, 15. And uh, he had this new book on our desk and he had a record player on, the, on his desk and he just sort of put his finger to his lips and like, Shh. and he played a record and it was, um, it was Eleanor Rigby by the Beatles. And then Shh. he put on Bob Dylan, uh, Hard Rains Are Gonna Fall. And then he said, pick up your book. And it was, uh, it was a poetry of Dylan Thomas. And he said, did you like those two records? Said, yeah. Well, they wouldn't really exist in that form without the, the man who wrote this book, Dylan Thomas. So that was his way, very clever. Wow. Of leading us into, oh, well, okay, we'll pay attention then. And I did pay attention. I, I loved Dylan Thomas and Ginsburg, you know. Um, and my friend, the aforementioned Dave Exton, who was the, the Bowie of the Bowie nut at school, he was a very smart kid. He was like a, a rebel, but he was very intelligent. And he, he, he turned me on to Kerouac and Burroughs and Rumbo and Baudelaire. You know, he's a 15 year old kid and um, he's into all this stuff. So that's where all that started. That's cool. do, do you know who Herbert Hunky was? Yes. Well, sure. you know what? Very few people do, but that's where your reading led to of that stuff. Cause he's kind of the unsung beat hero who Junkie was written about. Herbert Hunky, who Diane DePrima put out, his book Guilty of Everything. And that's kind of interesting. And, and the same, you know, I came to these, a lot of these writers more in the Henry Miller, Hubert Selby at the same age. And it's so important. I think when you're reading this kind of material at the age that we were mysteriously, however it came into our hands, it does really influence and affect the expansion of thought matter. And of course, yeah. what is reality? What is fiction? What is the life of a nomad? Especially the beat writers who, you know, to me, more than their writing, it was their lifestyle I respected. And they're like, that's going to be me. I'm going to be a freaking nomad and write about it. And that's how, how writers affected me at that period. Yeah. At the age of 14 and 15. Right, right. Yeah. I once got, I got to perform with uh, uh, Selby. Pardon me? Uh, Pardon me? I said I got to perform with uh, Mr. Selby Jr. I went on tour with him. He wrote the intro for my book, Paradoxy, when it first came out. Oh, okay. He was my yes. hero. I mean, I, I, Henry, Henry Rollins and I dug him out of, he hadn't been ever on a reading tour. And we literally knocked on his door and said, well, I think you should. And I produced an album that he was on as well called Our Fathers Who Aren't in Heaven. Very important. Requiem for a Dream, one of the most heartbreaking books ever written and best film. Really great film. Yeah, Darren great. Aronofsky, right? Yeah, brilliant. I, well, I, what I got to do with him was it was... Um... Yeah, when was that? <sighs> Who knows? I know. I Don't ask me about dates. I know. Yeah, was this in the UK uh, or was this in America? It was in LA here at the Royce Hall. It was, um, it was with Hal Wilner. Uh, and I, it was his... Yeah. If you're Alan Poe, his Poe yes. show, where you do it at Halloween, around right about this time, and um, we did, um, he, he read uh, from the Telltale Heart. And I had, uh, I had all this weird percussion stuff, and uh, I had- Were you the, were you the heartbeat? Were you the heartbeat under the floor? <laughs> we, we were doing all, 
Um, yeah, I had a little miniature antique uh, harp from the Victorian harp, and I would tap on that. And I had it wired up to an echo, echo unit and some other effects. But I also had this big vat full of water with contact mics inside. Oh, nice. Yeah. Oh, and wow. I had these wind chimes that are beat up. So they're all like distorted and twisted. And I put them, put them into the water. I chime them and put them into the water. So then they distorted and then I had echo like connected to the mics as well. So it made this extraordinary noise, very haunting. And then cellist Joyce Brooks was on stage. And also um, Wayne Kramer for the MC5. Was oh, yes. For the, on that as well. Were you close with Hal? With Hal, with Hal Wilner? Oh, yeah, with... He's one of my oldest friends. I mean, that, so, that really heartbreaking that, uh, you know, being in New York, there 30,000 people died in the first two months. He was one of the first victims. No, that, that not me for six. Yeah, I was went that? to his memorial. Uh, I went to his memorial recently. Oh. That was wonderful. At yeah. St. Anne's West. Uh, David, when did you decide to move to America? That was in the mid nineties, but it had always been on the card since, I mean, we went, first came to the States in 1980, that's Bauhaus, house. And that was New York and fell in love with it. I really fell in love with New York then. And, uh, and we were treated so well, it's much better than in England, you know, and that just continued. And then some, you know, and then Love and Rockets had us some, some good success here. And uh, we just had a great time and, and my brother moved to LA pretty early on. And then Daniel and I followed suit after that in the mid nineties. And you still live in LA and you still like it. Yeah, yeah. Why not? I, I, lived, here, I lived here twice and <laughs> now I'm just visiting. But I understand the poll. You moved to uh, Barcelona, didn't you? I lived in many places. That was one, yes. Yeah, yeah I love Barcelona. Absolutely fantastic. David, how did you come to work with the wizard, Alan Moore, uh, who is an incredible comic, cartoon, comic anime illustrator who does look like a wizard with his V for Vendetta. Well, how did that happen? I met Alan, yeah, in 1978. And uh, there, was a there was a local paper, the Chronicle and Echo, and there was a little ad, I noticed, it was a curious little ad. Um, it's really odd, and it said uh, something along the lines of the emperors of ice cream. <laughs> um, um, co conspirators, madmen, and uh, vagabonds, I think it was something, something like else that. weird. Wanted, wanted uh, new music night and day, and there was just a phone number. I thought, what is that? That's really intriguing. So I just called the phone number. <laughs> and it was um, it was answered by uh, an Alex Green who uh, then invited me for a drink at the Angel Hotel and he would tell me more about it. So we met up that night. And um, it was a kind of arts collective, the Emperors of Ice Cream, of which Alan was, was a, a part. And they were doing, uh, they're having a little get together in a back street in, um, in Northampton in a cellar the next night. And, and Alex invited me to that. And so, and so I went down there and it was actually in full flow. And there was Alan holding forth and reciting <laughs> his poetry. And he was actually reciting um, Old Gangsters Never Die, which I later added some music to but at that time it was he it was him it was a, a guy on a keyboard called pickle pickle um, no whoa. pickle <laughs> aka mr licorice who looked like adolf hitler okay um, i i did not i did not know i i did not know alan moore did performances before he put out his illustrative art so that's yeah. very interesting yeah, yeah. And there was a guy, Shrivs, who was just playing his very detuned guitar in a very awkward, angular way. There was a guy with a, uh, Alex on the saxophone. And um, 
And I noticed all the posters, they had all these posters on the walls, and they were all pinned with the image facing the wall. I thought, this is all very interesting. <laughs> I kind of want to be part of this. And I did become part of it. And then Alan invited me round to his house um, the next week. So I went round and... In Northampton. In Northampton. And he proceeded to roll up these foot-long spliffs. <laughs> hash, hash, and play me can. Nice. And, and, uh, and then he just, you know, he held me in thrall you know, for, for many well, hours. Well, Okay, so then you mentioned a spliff and Alan Moore. I was on my way up to meet him once. I guess to Northampton. I can't remember, and I don't know the year, but probably, when I, was, yeah, I would think. probably when I was living in London in the early 80s, and I was going up with a friend, and I had made some pot brownies, and she'd never had one. And on uh -oh. the train, she's freaking out. She mm -hmm. wants to pull the emergency cord no to stop. I'm like, do not do that. But the minute we got off the train... And there was Ellen Moore looking like the Grand Wizard. She was totally calm. <laughs> and I believe we went to his spectacular place. <laughs> you, you know, David, I was, I was going to ask you because I was, you, you, was going to ask you because I, I was like, when you moved to LA, is that you know when you start doing scoring and, and stuff like that? But it sounds like uh, non rock band. Uh, just accompaniment music you had been doing for a while at that point. So it seems like a, a natural transition when you moved to LA. Did you seek that out uh, or, or did people come to you or how did, how did you get into that, that world? Well, I, I, I've done very little in that area, actually. I mean, a little bit. And it's more like supplying songs and a little bit of incidental music. Um, underground film. And it's only underground stuff. It's more my, my brother's area and he's really accomplished as a as a film uh, score guy and uh writing for film and tv so so, um, so it's more like music directors come to you rather than being a score person is, is what you're getting at but yeah yeah when, when was the when did you decide that you were going to actually and it's uh, to me it's just because I have one in the cab and I have no idea. And I think it's one of the most difficult thing, things to put on is you wrote some plays and you had them produced. Now, when did you decide I need to write a play? Why a play at that time? And why not okay. just a short story, a novel or whatever? Well, how that came about was I had a, a really good publicist at the time, Versa Manos. And she was, she was in, uh, she worked in theater a lot, worked with actors and theater companies. And there was a theatre company in Atlanta, Georgia, called Dad's Garage. Um, and they were pretty respected little independent company. And they, they were friends of Versa. And they, they told her that they were looking for playwrights to uh, contribute 15-minute uh, plays. So they're going to do a series of these 15-minute plays. So put on like, you know, six or seven a, a night. And uh, it was an open theme, although it had to include uh, one piece of music. And so she said to me, I think you should have a go at that. And I never spoken to her about writing a play. I never even thought about it really, but she kind of like made me pull myself up and think, oh, maybe I could do that. I don't well, know. especially a 15 minute play, how great. I yeah. mean, not, <laughs> enough short, not enough short films, short plays or short songs, <laughs> if you ask me. Yeah, so I, I was on a long car, car journey once, uh, going, shortly after this um, idea came up, driving up to San Francisco and I was a passenger and I had a notepad and a pen and I just started writing about, they say write about what you know. So I wrote about going, going to see the Sex Pistols, you know, when I was 19. And that just, that whole, galvanizing explosion and my experience there. And I, by the time I finished the trip, I'd written this thing. And this piece of music was Anarchy in the UK. And I, I paraphrased that for the title, which is Anarchy in the Gold Street Wimpy. The Gold mm. Street <laughs> was where we, uh, us fledgling punks, would go after going to the pub, we'd go to the racehorse pub, get really plastered on lager, and some of us would be on speed, and that was never my thing, but I was on the lager. And this was the day that the, the Pistols, uh, Anakin in the UK came out, and the record store, where I got oh, all 
my early records, including that Hunky Dory, yes. uh, was next door to the pub. So we go in the pub and then go next door and buy a record usually. So I bought two copies of that, one for me, one for my girlfriend. And uh, went down to, staggered down to the Gold Street Wimpy. No, wait, and, now is Wimpy like a hamburger bar? Yes, it is, a Wimpy, yeah, yeah, exactly that, yeah. <laughs> and that's a, that's a real, that's, it's, I have to say it's one of the roughest, it's one of the roughest fast food ones I've been to, the Wimpy. And I remember one time I was on the road, and we had no choice. We went on the road, we had no choice, we were there, and I was like, I'll have that one. Ugh. And they gave it to me, and you know, this is this is like preservatives, preservatives galore buns, but the thing was already stale and moldy. And I said, I can't eat that. And the person said back to me, Oh yeah, it's not our most popular sandwich. <laughs> and I was like, What? I, I, I have to ask you this about Northampton because Ian White, who I played with for many years, who was in Gallon Drunk and the drummer of Big Sexy Noise, he would often get beaten up in Northampton just for being weird. Did you ever face any of that as a young weirdo? I mean, you said every as very day. young. Yeah, okay, every day. It's a very heavy place. Yeah. In fact, I found, I, I, when I went to New York in 1980, I found it a lot less intimidating than... Yeah. I, I, David, I would I'd agree more than anything. Like as an American, I don't I don't know because I'm not pro guns necessarily, but I think the threshold's a little different. Where 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 people, you know, you might someone pull out a gun here, so you're not going to see the amount of fights that you see in the UK. I mean, the British bars violence close. is like no other. But yeah. it's just a fo football hooliganism, the Chelsea yeah. smile, clockwork orange, yeah. and just about. Uh, based often, uh, like most stupid violence or prejudice, on how you look, on what you're wearing, on where you're from. So fucking yeah. ridiculous. Completely mindless, yeah. And, mindless. And, really, and very extreme and deadly. And but I'm, I'm just going to conclude my story here, yeah. about the Rock Hill Street Wimpy. Because so we, we end up there, and I'm really, I'm bl really blind drunk. And I'm, I need to have a, a pee. So I'm looking for the, for the bathroom, and somehow I wander into... The what is the freezer? I end up in the freezer. <laughs> Whoa. All these sides of meat hanging from hooks in the back. The meat freezer. <laughs> the meat freezer, yeah. And then, and I was so desperate to, to you uh -oh. know, um, have a wee wee that I ended up pissing in there. Oh boy. Right? And just all the <laughs> steam. And, and so I write about this in, this, in the play. Oh, it's on. the climax of the play. No, it's not the climax, but it's an incident in the play. Anyway, it was put on by Dad's Garage, and they flew me out to see what they'd done. And I was so blown away by it, because they'd used their imagination um, to interpret my, my words and my scenarios. And I was just like, OK, I love this. I, and I love seeing actors like bring this to life. So that was the, that was the first thing. And then I carried on from there. Oh, I think it's very interesting what you said, because, you know, with music, certainly when you collaborate with people, there's an allotment for a mysterious element that comes into it. But still, the parameters are only so far out of the realm of what you might have already imagined. But with a play or a script, that leaves so much to interpretation that it can just be Absolutely mind blowing. And I know this is, if you go back and read early scripts, like from say 69 to 73, and there are scripts online and just the descriptions are so accurate to the films that you then saw. But then if you read scripts later on, you're like, how the fuck did they even imagine? Because scripts are so badly written for the most part now that like what an imagination to even create when they do a glorious film from the shitty fucking script. And so that's what's interesting is you allowed as you have to, and it did not disappoint. It was inspiring for you to then continue doing in that format more of that type of uh, artistic output. Yeah, although the plays I wrote after that I've directed. Right, which is a big difference as well. Now, what came, how about your book? Um, who killed Mr. Moonlight? Now I haven't read it, but I'd love to. And it was Tyler Hubby that was telling me, "Oh yeah, that's a good one." Now what does that cover, and when did that come out? Your is it a memoir? Who it's killed Mr. Moonlight? So it's, it's a memoir pertaining to to, to Bauhaus. Okay. My experience, you know, of of that band, you know, from from it, it, its starting point to 
what I perceived to be its ending point in 2006. Obviously, that was not the case, and it had a resurgence. Um, so it's just, it's about that. It's just, you know, my, you know, a view from the, from the trenches, as it were. When, when you um, were writing your memoir, so for instance, you know, uh, I only know my method of when I'm writing a larger piece, like I have a discipline of a certain amount of hours, I'm going to dedicate to nothing but doing that. What was your process in writing your memoir? Was it just like, all right, I'm going to write my memoir, I'm going to start at the beginning, or would it be random stories coming in and then you assemble it? Was there a specific process or discipline you used to achieve writing a memoir? Yeah, very much so, because I, I realized that I had to be disciplined to get this thing done. And so I would have I would have a particular hours where I'd write. Or exactly. Start oh, please say that again. Exactly. Exactly. So, Go. Yeah, start at midday and I'd write for two hours till two. And even if I had a flow going at two o'clock, I'd stop. Right. And it then could be one sentence or 100 pages. You have that discipline of that. That's how you get it done. Yeah. And also, if you if you have got that flow going, it um, sort of ferments then and you, you, you want to get back to it. But I, then I would not get back to it until two hours later for one hour. And then I'd write, and then I'd sit down and have a stiff drink. <laughs> um, what, so, would that, uh, that, what would that stiff drink be at the time? At the time, it was uh, same as now, whiskey. Uh, sc sc Scotch whiskey, Irish whiskey, bourbon? Oh, okay. um, all of the above, really, but not nice. the same. We love you for that, David J. We love you for that. <laughs> yeah, because you had the Irish whiskey backstage, didn't you? I have a little of my coffee right now because I'm talking to you, but that's the only reason. Ha ha. Do you, do you like the PD whiskeys? Do you like the, the Islas and the Sky? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I want to um, go, go back to discipline for a minute because let's just compare because, you know, all writers have very different practices. Some will write a 60 page outline, and I'm like, hey, the book is half done. It's so important important i think with writing that you have a time-based discipline now with music for instance if you have a band you have to re rehearse that's a time-based discipline in order to achieve where you want to go with it but i think that's especially important with writing because i mean for me i'm not going to write a single sentence until i'm ready to do it but if i have the discipline at the time whether it's one word or a hundred pages that's when you focus and free up everything else. What's the difference, for instance, when you're writing music? Is it a more organic thing or like, how does the music come into you? Or is it again, a time-based discipline? Like I have this project, I have a concept and I'm gonna work on it in this, you know, these hours a day or what's your process with music then? Is it more differently organic? It's completely the opposite. Right, um, exactly. Because, yeah, it just like, it just bubbles up. And usually the words come first, and I, I find I, I write out a whole lyric, and then and then I pick up a guitar, and it just it comes very quickly. But I never try to write, you know. I just let it. Exactly. Wait, 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 Tim, just one minute. But that is very interesting, and I completely understand it because some of the inspiration you can't force it anyway. Some of the things you have to create, you have to have a more restrictive discipline. It's very interesting that you said, go ahead, Tim, I'm sorry. No, but you're talking about writing, but you're also a bass player. Do you do you practice bass? Are, you know, I'm a bass player. I'm curious, besides the dub guys, who are some of the, uh, your bass influences? Or is that just, I just fit, I'm the, I'm the bass player, that's my role, I'm just going to put in whatever I put in. Were you ever? No, I never practice. So I've never, never really practiced. Neither do uh, I. I hate, I don't need to practice. <laughs> no, to be very uh, immediate, spontaneous. And now it's got to a level where, like, for example, I talked about the Night Crickets album. When I was working on that album, Victor would send his drum, what he would do is he'd lay down a drum part and it would be all the way through. It'd be like three minutes, four minutes, with some changes in it. And it's sort of uh, kind of uh, not dictated, but suggested the form of, what was to follow, but I would purposely not even hear those tracks until I was ready to do a take. And I just, and so what you're hearing on the record is actually me improvising a bass part because we got it pretty much every time. So it's the first time I've heard that track. It's the first time I played that bass line. 
and probably the last time. So it's so, me, so, me, so meaning you don't you don't try to uh, simulate or uh, remake what you made on the album live. It's just, it's basically you're going over chord changes and you're just kind of going with the flow live. When you say it's the last time you played that bass line. Well, we don't. We have we haven't played live, and I don't know if we ever will. I mean, it was conceived as a studio project. So I well, I'm going to bring this over to Tim Dahl for a minute because Tim has done a lot of improvisational stuff live, which we we also do together. And having studied for him under Yusuf Latif, just a musical genius anyway, is I love when there is somebody who can both have the discipline of creation, whatever format, but also can be in the moment of creation, improvising. David J, we might have to do something eventually together. You never fucking know. <laughs> but I think that that's so important when we are as 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 creatively schizophrenic to have all of these different kinds of either disciplines, improvisational, in the moment uh, possibilities. And that is what separates or divides those that continue to do different things than those who continue to make the same fucking album for 20 years in a row, which uh, we have not done. Thank you very much. And by the way, I have not heard yet that Death Valley 69 remix, but I'm going to the minute we get off the Zoom. Oh, okay. okay. What was that about? Uh, well, that? It was, okay, it's Paul, Paul Staffham. He's a brilliant songwriter. He co wrote uh, a lot of like, hits with uh, Peter Murphy, Cuts You Up, he wrote the music for, um, if you remember that one. But he's got this project called Dark Flowers where He's initiating the music, but he's inviting a lot of other musicians to make a contribution, a lot of guest vocalists, and he asked me to be part of that. And as a kind of spin-off, because that's all original music, but as a spin-off, he wanted to do an album of murder ballads. And he just gave me a list to choose from, and that was on the, my list. And it was actually, when, as soon as I saw that, I thought, oh, yeah, I could have a crack at that. So and, wait, wait, um, wait, wait, one minute. Death Valley 69 which I recorded with Sonic Youth years ago, was on a list of murder ballads that this guy gave you to do what to? I'm lo I've lost to, your- uh, To do what? Yeah, what, what? I don't understand the correlation. What did you do with it? What is this remix you're talking about? Well, it's, I mean, it's a cover. It's a new version of it. Oh, it's um, a, okay. Brand. Oh, I cannot wait. Yeah, it's not, no, it's not a remix. It's a it's, brand new, like a cover. Can we play it? Can we play it on this uh, podcast? Sure. I can't wait. Um, yeah. So, and it's uh, yeah from a, um, an album of murder ballads. Paul plays practically all the music, um, and uh, just again, just I did that vocal in one take. So um, did I, <laughs> of course. Yes. Okay. Good. But uh, well, I have a female part on it. It's this singer called Shah, C H A R. Really. Very talented young girl in, in England, and she does a backup on it. I cannot um, wait to hear it, and we're going to play it on this podcast. Now, speaking of female vocalists, I have to ask you, you worked with Jill Tracy, the Chanteuse, the Poisoner from San Francisco, this Jill Tracy? Yeah, I love Jill, yeah, the Duchess. I love I'm Jill Tracy. I need to have her on this podcast. She's actually played with us before. What was the name of her album, like a Poisoner's Handbook? Doesn't matter. Was it Jill the lost, lost art of poisoning or something. <laughs> Jill like Tracy Jill. is an incredible shampoos from San Francisco. Cabaret. So, what did you do with Jill Tracy, and how did that come about? Um, well, I'd heard of Jill um, from musician friends in San Francisco, and um, her name would often come up, and and it would also be the case where they would say, "You, in particular, have to meet her because you would." you'd find a lot in common and uh, and sure enough I did finally meet her in a, in a bar in San Francisco and uh, we, we really hit it off and uh, would share music a lot of music other artist music and then just very organically you know we played a couple of shows together and then so wait a second you played a couple of shows together meaning um a double header or did you play music with her? What, what, what do you mean by Initially, that? Initially it was me doing a solo thing or with a couple of musicians and she opened for me, you know, and I, I invited her to join me on the encore, you know, and then we wrote together. We did, a, I think, one of my favorite versions of Bella, actually. She, wow. She oh, amazing. 
Yeah, it's beautiful. She does this uh, very classical introduction, like an overture. And uh, that, that works out really well. Yeah, you should check that out. Her artwork and her music, she's very unique and it's very witchy. Chill Tracy from San Francisco. Anybody who doesn't know, we're going to have her on the show. I've done both, uh, you know, spoken word shows where she's been on the bill. She even played with the retrovirus not that long ago. All right, just because we don't have much time left, I'm just going to go through this stuff. What about Jujuku? How did you come to work with the, the, the people of Jujuku? Yeah, the master musicians. Oh, amazing. <laughs> that was, yeah, that was by uh, Dub Gabriel, the aforementioned, who was the, the guy who put together the record with you, Roy. And he's friends with them. And uh, they would come up whenever they played San Francisco. He's based up there. They would stay with him. And he invited me to be, well, to first of all, go and see their, their concert. And then the next night, they were all coming around and having a, a jam session and they had a big vat of this, this soup. I think, I think I had a goat's head floating in it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, in fact, he did. Uh, and they were all in there and he invited some other players, mainly jazz guys, right. um, to, to jam with them. And I mean, they played continually for hours, literally hours. Hours, hours. And I brought my electric bass and plugged in, you know, and it was rather terrifying when he was sort of like, taking it in turn, we're all sitting in a big circle. circle. And then Bashir, who's the leader, you know, right. give you the nod to solo. It's like, oh my God, how <laughs> did they? But, but what, year, what year was that? Do you remember? You know, I have to- I'm I have to, not good with it. It doesn't matter. My, my journals to- Yeah, yeah it doesn't, it doesn't matter. Very weird. Uh, this was well, about- but, but look, when we're talking about you know, the master music musicians of Jujuko. This kind of music is timeless. Why should we have to remember the year that you were performing with them in this circle in front of a huge vat of soup? <laughs> it's, out, it's outside of time, yeah. It's One, outside uh, of time. Happened the next night, um, Bashir and, and, and Doug Gabriel, they asked me to stay and play on this session, which was a really special session. It's actually one of the high points of not just my musical career, but my life, I would say. Whoa. And uh, back in the village in Shajuka, uh, but she's first son was being born and he couldn't be there because he's on tour. And it, it was that night. So we came, we came up with this music to usher in. Oh, wow. Son. Salah Hadin, who is now, you know, destined to be the leader. So this is moment. I'm getting like shivers now. I just got it. shivers. I just got yeah, shivers. It was a so moment. beautiful. But we have this music with Bashir playing the, the pipes, and uh, we had a, a, a guest vocalist, and, and Dub Gay was doing like electronic stuff. I'm playing real dub bass. Oh, and he so was beautiful. Born. We found out he was born as we were making that music. I still have goosebumps. I still have goosebumps from that. Yeah, that was special. I understand, wonderful. So you've done so much, you've worked with so many people. I mean, you know, people always ask me, it's like, oh, who do you wanna work with? I'm like, hey, no, my concepts come before the collaborators, but is there anyone on your ideal list or what are, you've done so many different kinds of things. What's next for you? Are you I, first of all, also, how did the pandemic? Well, during the pandemic, you were doing remote recording. We were all doing weird things. Yeah, and painting. I got into painting. Got, well. Okay, this is oh, uh, got into paintings. Went back to painting. That's it. What's this, uh, abstract paintings, portrait paintings? What are these? They're semi abstract. I mean, I didn't know what I was going to do subject wise, I just started painting. Do, do you find it very relaxing to be painting? Like it's a relaxing art form or, you know, okay, I want to do a painting, right? Cathartic, therapeutic, very much so. And it's just great to have a painting on the go. You know, it's when you're away from the painting and in the back of your head, you think, she's waiting for me, you know, and I, whenever I feel <laughs> right, I go back and visit and give her a kiss, you know? Have you so, had exhibitions uh, of your paintings? Um, but I've got, I've got two galleries here in LA who want to put on shows. So yeah, I'm going to def definitely do that at some point. I did eight big canvases. 
Oh, great. Oh, wow. Large scale. We love it. Yeah. Yeah. And it needed to be large scale. It, it just felt right. It was something I've been praying off for a long time. But I thought, okay, this is this shit's going down. So the first thing I did was I went out to the art store before they all closed down. <laughs> yeah. I just got a bunch of acrylics and paintbrushes and spray cans. And I had all my tools. You had the tools ready to go. To the cave to be hermetic and then just like go into painting you know world. there are there are just some people i include us in this and many others who've also been on this podcast that you know one form of art or creation it's just not enough and and it's for some reason i don't know exactly what it is i mean i always call myself a musical schizophrenic but i don't know what it is that we need all of these different formats and anybody that's just has one. I mean, it's great if they can just channel it into one direction, but we have to go all over the place. We have to write plays. We have to write books. We have to do paintings. I do photography. We have to work with collaborators. We have to have, in my opinion, when we are collaborating, at least the way I see it, the sacred space outside of ego and bullshit or something unique is going to be created that would not exist without those energies coming together. And this is the beauty of why we continue to do what we do. And with that, I would love to say, this is the Lydia and Smin with Lydia Lange, Tim Dahl, and the ever-created David J. Thank you so much, my friend. Thank, Thank you, you, David. Pleasure meeting you. I'm really happy we met, my friend. It was. <laughs>